As we are gathering together here this morning, we will be having an opening time of a processional. So the handbell choir will be doing a choral reading of scripture to get us started out today. And then they will lead us. We'll make a procession out through the side doors, down the hallway, into the sanctuary, around the sanctuary, waving palms, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, Jesus. Whatever shouts of Palm Sunday acclamation that come to your heart, that the Spirit leads you, shout it, yell it, and then we will be singing together or opening hymn in the sanctuary as we gather together for worship. Invite the bell choir to lead us with our opening scripture from Mark 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and in Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple.
You may be seated. It is a joy. We give thanks that we are able to gather together in the house of the Lord today. Today, as we gather for this Palm Sunday worship celebration, the beginning of Holy Week, there are many different events coming ahead, events that we know about already, events that the disciples and the people of Jesus' day had no idea of what was to come. They entered into Jerusalem that day assuming their king, Jesus, the son of the lineage of David would become the new ruler. And he did, but in a much different manner than what they had anticipated. As we enter into worship today, we each have our expectations, our anticipations. May we set ourselves and all that we have brought from our world around us aside. Lay it at the feet of the cross that we may encounter the risen Lord in a new, fresh way, and we may embark on an amazing Holy Week ahead of us, like we have never embarked before. As we go into this week, there are many different ways in which we can live into this faith and be able to experience a holy story in a new way, in a different way. There are many different movies that are out there from the passion, uh, the Passion movie, or there's another more modern passion narrative that was filmed in New Orleans. New Orleans. Thank you. And has modern twist to it, modern perspective to it. Many different ways that you can do that. You can sit down and you can read through the Gospels and read the accounts. However it is, we ask that we all together, in our own separate individual places, Commit to reading and reenacting and reliving, re-encountering this Holy Week in a powerful way, knowing that we are all doing this together. So that as we gather back together next Sunday to celebrate the resurrection, we are truly transformed. Today we will also be celebrating one great hour of sharing. People have brought in fish banks. We'll be having our fishing derby and Fellowship Hall after church. So many great things, a lot of fun planned for that as well. So please stick around for that. Are there other announcements in the midst of the wonderful travel weather? And I do say that with great sarcasm. Coming down the roads were a little bit slippery. I will be glad a week from now to know that we're almost going to be closing on a house and we'll be abiding a resident here in Fond du Lac. So looking forward to that. But do thank you for your prayers and safety and all the travels back and forth over the past couple of months. Many different things have been going on. I'll admit, yeah, I haven't quite got settled in. So are there other announcements that I'm forgetting about here that I didn't grab? Anything? I see a couple of heads shaking no, so I think we have that. There are always ways in which God speaks to us. There are always ways in which we hear the gospel message afresh. I invite us to turn our hearts to God as we open our time together with prayer. Hosanna, blessed is Jesus who comes in God's name. We stand at the gates of our Jerusalem. We wave our branches high. We get caught up in the excitement of the parade. Jesus sits astride a donkey, a beast of burden, bearing a most precious gift. Joy fills our heart this day as we shout our hosannas. Praise God for the wondrous ways in which our lives have been touched. Let us worship and celebrate this day. Amen. Please stand to join me in the call to worship. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Hosanna! Hosanna in our highest. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Hosanna! Hosanna in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. 
let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna. Hosanna O oh Lord, save us. Hosanna. Hosanna Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna the Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. Hosanna. Hosanna you are my God, and I will give you thanks. Hosanna. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Hosanna. Hosanna His love endures forever. Hosanna. When the parade is over, do we pick up our lives, brush them off, and live in the old way? Do we toss our palm branches aside so we can grasp the charm and appeal of the world? As we begin the journey through the holiest of weeks, let us speak the truth as we confess to our God, praying together. Today, we celebrate the parade of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Although we wave our branches and shout Hosanna, we have not always behaved as disciples. Too often, we have wandered from the path of Christ and stumbled along on our own. Yet here we stand in the parade route, waving our branches. Have mercy on us, God of holiness. Help us turn our lives around and truly serve you. Help us understand the deep meaning of Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We empty ourselves of everything which keeps us from following you. And now, a moment of silent confession.
save us lord jesus we welcome you into our hearts transform us into the people you want us to be amen hear the good news jesus though he was in the form of god did not regard equality with god as something to be exploited but he emptied himself taking the form of a slave and becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross through his obedience we are freed from whatever sin sin enslaves us thanks be to god the peace of jesus christ be with you I invite you to share the peace of Christ with others. be seated. The psalm reading is from Psalm 118 verses 1 through 2 and 19 through 29. We're using the Common English Bible version, but you can find it in your pew on page 565. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Let Israel say it. God's faithful love lasts forever. Open the gates of righteousness for me so I can come in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. Those who are righteous enter through it. I thank you because you answered me, because you were my saving help. The stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astounding in our sight. This is the day the Lord acted. We will rejoice and celebrate in it. Lord, please save us. Lord, please let us succeed. The one who enters in the Lord's name is blessed. We bless all of you from the Lord's house. The Lord is God. He has shined a light on us. So lead the festival offerings with ropes all the way to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will lift you up high. Give thanks to the Lord, because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. Our epistle reading today. From the letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and this is also called the Christ hymn. This is one of the earliest hymns of the Christian church. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus, 
Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. <coughs> so have you ever had, I know when I was a kid, there used to be of chocolates and in the all the little chocolates were in different little containers on the lid on the top it told you what was inside well guess what somebody upset the chocolates one day. and so we put them all back in but we weren't really sure but somebody put them back in and some of them are circles and some of them are squares and the ones that had nuts in, you could kind of see they were the ones with nuts. But the cream-filled ones that had different flavors, nobody knew what they were. But if you looked, we, we, we were, some friends and I were looking, and, and we'd say, well, here, this one is supposed to be a marshmallow one. And then guess what? No, it wasn't a marshmallow one. I think it was uh, orange. And when, it was just as good, probably, but if you're anticipating and you're thinking it's going to be a marshmallow one and it turns out to be orange, that's kind of a shock, isn't it? Well, that's kind of what expectations are. When you're expecting something and something else, sometimes something else happens that isn't what you were expected. Well, the person that got that orange one didn't like oranges, so that wasn't a good expectation. And they weren't very happy about it. They were expecting a marshmallow, and they got an orange. Hmm. Well, sometimes we have expectations. Maybe you're expecting, um, have you ever had a, a day when you thought you were going to go out to eat? Your parents picked you up, and you thought you were going to go out to eat, and you just really ate on the back porch instead, and you had leftovers? Yeah. Those can kind of be disappointing days, right? Well, in my picture today is a day that had different expectations for people. The people that were looking to have this parade for Jesus, they were looking for a king, a king that was going to come and he was going to take care of all the people that were not being nice to them. And it was going to be a big day. And what happened when kings would come in at this time for parades. They'd come in on a big horse, big, strong, powerful horse, and there'd be armies with them. D does that look like a big, strong, powerful horse? No. Is there a big army there? No. So this was the first day that people started getting some of their expectations weren't being met. Some of the things they thought were going to happen just weren't happening. Hmm. So just like my, the person who didn't really like the orange, it was okay. Turned out they kind of liked that little orange piece of candy a little bit more later. Found out they may, might like orange and chocolate together. Sometimes people like that. The people here were looking for that savior. They were looking for that king that was gonna come, that was gonna take care of all their problems in the way that they thought was gonna happen. And that's not what happened. So Jesus didn't listen to those expectations. He listened to God. 
And what God had for those people, for, our, for us, was much more important, was much better. Sometimes we don't know what our parents have planned for us. Sometimes we think we know what we're supposed to, what the best plan is going to be, right? Do you ever know more than your parents? Yeah, yeah, we do, don't we? And then, and then we find out, hey, we didn't have that same idea, but your idea was actually kind of better. Our parents kind of know stuff, right? Well, sometimes we think we know more than God. Sometimes we think we know the way that everything should be lined up and all should happen just this special way. But we find out we don't know more than God, do we? No. So this time was a very special day for those people, but they started having their expectations not met. So when you have a time when your expectation isn't met, you can either be angry and upset about it, or you can take a deep breath and ask God to maybe help you figure out how this is going to work out. Right. So the people at this time didn't understand. We know the whole story, don't we? We know what happens on Easter. We know what happens for the rest of time because of that but they didn't know. So let's pray today that um, we have God's help in finding all those expectations that we might think are not right. On those days when we think that things aren't gonna be right. All right, let's take a time. Loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for the gifts that you give to us each and every day. We thank you for expectations and we know that sometimes our expectations aren't met. We know that you have those plans for us. We thank you so much for Jesus, who can give us more than we ever imagined. We ask that you would help us to share the love that you give to us and the hope that we have in Jesus with everyone that we meet, that they may feel that love. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. I think the message from that children's message could become an entire sermon series about all of the expectations that we have for life, for the church, for so many things. And how do we set those aside and be open to the new things that the Spirit is bubbling up in our midst? Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your holy word, for this opportunity to gather together, to worship you, to glorify you. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our heart, be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeem. Amen. I don't know about you, but for me, there are were so many smiles on faces walking in, the joyful feelings radiating from shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, amidst that familiar waving of the palm branches, singing all glory, Lord, and honor. That's why I don't do the solos. <laughs> Thou art the King of Israel. Thou, David's royal son, who in the Lord's name comest, the King and Blessed One. Even in Old English, that seems to have a certain power, a certain presence to it, especially for those of us who know Jesus Christ, believe in Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. What exactly is it that we're shouting? I do not think that it means what you think it means. Yeah. Yeah, somebody caught that reference. Okay, 1987, Princess Bride. Wallace Shawn's character, Vizzini, uses the word inconceivable over and over and over. And finally, henchman Inigo Montoya, played by Mandy Patinkin, looks at Vizzini and it tilts his head 
like a dog looking at this weird sound that doesn't make sense, says, you keep using that word. I do not think that it means what you think it means. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We keep using those words, but I do not think they mean what we think it means. Most people have come to hear and understand Hosanna as some sort of joyful proclamation, some sort of form of celebration akin to, hooray, woohoo, all right, this is awesome, go God. Sort of like aligning Jesus riding into Jerusalem, along with the celebrations of Packers beating Dallas last January. Or maybe the underdog, James Madison, upsetting our Wisconsin Badgers in the NCAA tournament. Ooh, I heard some groans on that one. How quickly you change from celebration to groan. We are all human, are we not? The feelings of the Packer win, those are easy for us to relate to and to resonate with. But making connection to those celebrations, they were real celebrations, even though they defeated our Wisconsin Badgers, those connections aren't quite as easy, and we really don't want to connect with those celebrations, do we? We know the triumphant sounds of Hosanna are soon going to be turning to these orchestrated chants of crucify him. But before we jump ahead to celebrating the victory of the empty grave, the eternal life, we need to experience that dark journey of the cross. Hosanna. What exactly does Hosanna mean? This word is a transliteration. Transliteration is a conversion from one language to another, from the Hebrew into our modern English language, using some similar letters. Oftentimes, though, in the midst of this transliteration, the original meaning is often lost a little bit, changed a little bit, as they would have been shouting Hosanna, even as, Jew, as Jesus walked in, most people wouldn't have been speaking Hebrew, they would have been speaking Aramaic, and so a lot of the common folk would have known these words and known how to say them, but they may not have even fully understood what the original meaning had. The word Hosanna comes from Psalm 118, verse 25, which we read today. In Hebrew, it reads, Ana Yahweh Hoshi Ana. Hoshi Ana. Hoshi Ana. Hosanna. It's an, it means literally, I pray Yahweh, the unspoken name of God. I pray Yahweh, save us now. But that first word, Ana, I pray, it's an emphatic interjection, having a feeling of, I'm begging you, or using the old English again, I beseech thee. There's just a certain power to that. I beseech thee. I beg of you. I'm pleading. Please, please save us. That is what we're saying when we say Hosanna. It has a definite sense of urgency, intensity to it. Lord, save us. This psalm is one of several that were hymns of ascent that were sung as God's people marched into the temple so that they might confess their sin, submit their lives back to God, and then return to their ordinary, everyday lives as forgiven people, new. But they, back in the Old Testament times, they did not return to their everyday, ordinary lives the same way that you and I do. You see, when they went back to their everyday, ordinary lives, it was a different world. The knowledge of God's transcendence, God's inbreaking, God's presence all around them, that was just expected. It was understood. There was no separation of the sacred and the secular as we know today in our world. So as we go back to our everyday ordinary in many ways, we leave the sacred here in this sacred place. And we go out and we live our secular lives. There is a difference from the Old Testament understanding until now. 
And we need to grasp that, acknowledge that, confess that. Lord, save us. Depending on what translation in the English you read, it comes across a little bit differently. Common English Bible, Lord, please save us. Lord, please let us succeed. New Revised Standard Version, which you might be a little more familiar with. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Eugene Peterson's The Message says, Salvation now, God. Salvation now. Oh yes, God, a free and full life. We've talked about, Lord, please save us a little bit. What about the second half of this verse? I think it's equally as misunderstood in our modern world. Lord, please let us succeed. Give us success. Our interpretation of whatever might be a free and full life, it does not mean what you think it means for most people. Success, the free, full life of a Christian in our dualistic, sacred versus secular, social imaginary of the modern West, it's become distorted from the true biblical meaning. Success from the biblical text is not about climbing the social or financial ladders of life. It's not about comfort. It's not about power. It's not about control, any of that. There's another famous line from The Princess Bride, repeated over and over by Patinkin's character. My name is Anigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And he says it over and over and over as he gets into this giant sword fight. There are many people in the church today who've taken a similar attitude toward the secular culture all around us in the name of God. And it's honestly, though, an attitude of revenge, an unbiblical attitude, even though we frame it as if it is religious. But in all honesty, it's really not much different than so many different things throughout Christian history where we look back and say, how did they ever think that? Our attack against the secular is, in a sense, an attack of revenge. One of the common narratives that I hear describes the pain, the fear of the statistical decline in the mainline church. Yeah, there is pain, there's fear. I hear those in the decline of membership and attendance. But it's as if we're pre proclaiming over and over, we are God's people. You have killed our father, prepare to die. And we go out into the world to get rid of all the unreligious secular attacks against Christianity. The mainline church, yeah, it is in statistical decline, but God is far from dead. Nietzsche was so wrong. For myself, after three decades of church ministry, I've come to realize that the real problems, the real issues that require our confession and submission are often not the ones that we first notice. The statistical decline in the mainline church, the loss of church attendance, loss of the church, the big church, universal at the center of our modern society, that's really not what we think it is. Andrew Root, in his book, Faith Formation in a Secular Age, explains in great detail how just for the past several decades here, we'll talk about, he goes way back, but for the past several decades, we've framed this same problem that has been taking place. It's not just something post-COVID. This problem of decline we framed as a subtraction issue. Faith has been subtracted from our cultural and societal lives. And therefore, we've been told the solution is to counteract the subtraction in one way or another. The church leaders, those of us supposedly in charge, we're supposed to be keeping young people from subtracting church participation from their lives, keeping faith from disappearing down the drain, he puts it. These approaches do seem appealing, and I'll admit, 
for the first half of my ministry doing youth ministry, there are many of these claims that I bought into and said, yes, I need to be a paid youth director at a church, and that's going to be the solution. And if we just get some youth into the church, the church will be alive and vibrant. And No, they seem appealing because they promise action. Quick action is what we prefer, is it not? Reality of this oversimplified contention about plugging the drain, as he puts it, that somehow by plugging the drain, we're going to contain the faith of our youth. He says the drain that we're attempting to plug is in a bathtub at the bottom of the ocean. It really doesn't matter if that drain is plugged or not. There's something else so much bigger that we don't even notice it. We're right in the midst of it. Our issues are much deeper, much different. One of the key issues is that we as a society, we've added layer upon layer of what it means to be authentic human beings. We've added new narratives, new moral codes, new identities beyond God to direct our lives. Most people today are not only insulated from sensing God's activity in their life, many feel no real need for God. Our world has been framed as a natural, material place, void of the mystery of transcendence, the mystery of God's inbreaking participation in our everyday, ordinary lives. That is what we long for. Do we need Jesus to save us? Most definitely, yes. But the deeper question is to save us from what? For what? The people of Jesus' day needed to be saved in basically the same way. And they, like us, were also not fully aware of what they needed to be saved from. They had their expectations. But God, God had something even better planned out. The people of Jesus' day were under the oppression of Roman military occupation. Taxes were high, inflation was on the rise, Public unrest was at the boiling point. It was like a pressure cooker about to explode in disastrous revolts, which resulted in destruction of the temple and life itself as they knew it. Not much different from what we hear of our world today. They were eager to start a fight, provoking Jesus to take that first swing. Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of David. They wanted Jesus to overthrow the Roman Empire. They wanted peace, shalom. But the way in which they expected it to come about, it's not the way of God. Jesus did come to overcome the rulers of this world, to claim the throne of David for all time to come. But the ways of God are so much different than the ways of this world. And that is what we hear in the Christ hymn from Philippians chapter 2. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, don't we hear that in our world? Watch out for what is better for others. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God. Jesus was God. Jesus could have done anything. He did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. Instead, he emptied himself. He set it all aside. He took on the form of a slave, a servant. He became like us. He took on human flesh, dwelt among us. And when he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. And therefore, because of his obedience, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names. So that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, 
and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hosanna, Lord, save us. May that be our prayer as we enter into this holy week. But may our prayer also be framed so that we are saying, do not save us by the manner in which we seek revenge or that we seek to bring the things of this world back to the ways we remember when life was so much better and the church was so much better. Was it? Save us by allowing us to embrace the mystery of your spirit breaking into our lives, by allowing us to fully encounter the risen Lord, by allowing us to encounter God's holy transcendence in the everyday, the ordinary, as we journey with Jesus and with one another this week, this holy week, walking step by step by painful step, through the pain, the persecution, the torture, the agony. Emptying ourselves of all power that comes from this world. Learning more and more what it means to truly confess our self-centeredness, confess it to God, and to submit our worldly securities over to God, to truly trust in God for our salvation. Not just our eternal other life, dualistic salvation, but our salvation here and now in the kingdom of God here on earth. May we long to know what that is like and to be able to share that together with one another and with all of God's people. Hosanna, Lord, save us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In response to God's word, we remember that all things come from God. All things are simply entrusted with us. They are not given to us, but entrusted with us to us, to be used to further God's kingdom. We offer ourselves back to God. We offer a portion of that which God has entrusted to us as God's tithes. And above that, we offer special offerings, special offerings for ministries of the church and of the church community. Feed my starving children, one great hour of sharing, pave the way, all offerings above and beyond our tithe. Above all, may we offer our very selves as the ushers come forward to gather God's ties and our offerings.
Almighty God, as we bring forth ourselves and lay ourselves at the feet of your empty cross, we also bring forth a portion of that which you have entrusted to us. Take these tithes, these offerings. Take us, multiply us, use us to further your kingdom here in this earth, and allow us to have the eyes of our hearts opened beyond our wildest expectations that we might be able to see all that you have ahead of us. Amen. You may be seated as we turn to God in the time of prayer. Almighty, gracious God, as we gather together this morning, shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us. As we remember the triumphal entry, as we have come to know it, of your entrance into Jerusalem, sitting astride that donkey, the donkey and the colt, not a great majestic white stallion with every day coats and palm branches laid in the ground, waving in the air. This is not a scene that we are accustomed to seeing. We are much more accustomed to seeing the celebration that likely was happening at the same time on the other side of the holy city. The Roman emperor entering in with all of the glory, all of the festivity, the best of the best that this world has to offer. A show of force, a show of power. Lord, today, there are so many ways in which the show of power of worldly force is causing so much harm, evil, atrocity. We remember those who have lost their lives to the recent bombings, the terrorist attacks, to the wars, to the oppressive regimes around the world, to those who have been polarized and ostracized from friends and family, to those who sit alone for a multitude of reasons, from health, healing, illness, disease. Lord, we lift up those who long to be with someone else, with those who feel like there is no hope to come. May you send your blessing upon them in a special way. May their eyes be opened May they grasp firmly to hold on to the end of that hope rope of their life. May we do the same wherever we are at as we have been feeling like we are sliding and sliding. Remind us that we are not the ones in control. Lord, allow us to let go of all that that encumbers us, all that that gives us a sense, a false sense of control, of power, of peace. May we grasp you as we enter into this holy week, as we prepare to share that holiest of holy meals that you shared with your disciples, that you offer to us. May we encounter that meal on Thursday night with a true sense of mystery, fully expecting to encounter you. May we encounter you that night because we have been encountering you in many unexpected ways 
in the days leading up to that. Open our eyes, Lord, that we might see the ways in which you are calling us to be a guest, to be welcomed into the home and the life of those who have been marginalized. Lord, allow us to gather back together to celebrate the resurrection with new eyes as transformed people, with a commitment to gather together, to worship you and to seek you, with a commitment to confess all that is wrong, to confess all that we have done, to confess all that we have not done, but we should have been doing and to surrender our lives to you. Lord, hear the prayers of our hearts as we lift our voices together in unity with all those from all times and all places who together pray as you have taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our response, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. As we go out into the world, we go out into the world knowing that God is present there. May we go out into the world shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us. May the attitudes of our hearts be open to the unexpected for which God has for us. May we gather back together to continue to worship and glorify God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in the name of God, worshiping God. Hosanna, Lord, save us.